Good morning. morning. Welcome to Cam Church on this fourth Sunday of Advent. My name is Luke, and I have the honor and privilege to serve as pastor of this congregation. A special welcome to those who are joining us online on the live stream or who will be watching the recorded version of this service. We're so thankful you could be here with us in that way as well. We always kick off with a couple announcements. Of course, we have, a, we have you know, something coming up that's pretty big uh, this week, so we'll be mostly focused on that. First, a reminder that tonight we have our drive-through nativity uh, from 5 p.m. to 6.30 p.m. You can drive through, and if you can, we would ask that you uh, consider bringing uh, canned goods that will go towards the Marin County Food Bank. Uh, also, we are welcoming unwrapped toys for our Christmas gift barrels for those in need. And you can read all about what uh, we're looking for and how you can help in your bulletin under the drive through Nativity banner, and we hope to see you this evening. Also, I want to remind you that on Christmas Eve, we will have two in-person and live-streamed services, the 4 p.m. Wiggles and Giggles service geared towards families with young children, but folks of all ages are welcome to be here. And then at 7 p.m., we have our traditional candlelight service with our choir, which I know many of us are looking forward to as well. Now... Here comes the pastoral request. We are still in need of a few ushers for both services. We have some of those slots filled, but we need a couple more at both services. So if you plan to be at one of those services and you'd be willing to help us hand out bulletins and we're uh, planning to take an offering during that time, a special offering, and you could help us out with that, no experience is required. Uh, all, all we need is somebody who is, uh, has that willing spirit, and we'll show you the way. So if you're planning to attend worship and you feel that you could help us out with ushering, please let me know. You can email me. You can find me after church. Whatever it takes, my phone number's in the bulletin. Let me know, and we'd love to have your help. So those are the announcements I have for us this morning. At this time, I'm going to invite some members of the Maynard family to come forward who are going to help us with our call to worship and Advent lighting. And I invite the rest of you, as you are able, to please stand. All right, who's our candle lighter? There you go. And our reader can step right here. One of you reading? Or would you like me to read? What's that? Okay, perfect. You read the L, the leader. Today, we light four candles. The first candle is called Hope, and it is a reminder that God's promises are true. The second candle is called Peace, God's gentle, loving peace for our lives. The third candle is called joy because of God's absolute presence in our lives. The fourth candle is called love because of God's great love for us. Come, all is ready. Let the light of these candles called hope, peace, joy, and love bring brightness to your spirits. Amen. I invite you to remain standing as you're able for our first hymn. It's number 234, O Come All Ye Faithful. We're singing verses 1 through 4.
may be seated. If you open up your bulletin on the first page, you will find our opening prayer, and I invite you to join me in these words of prayer. Lord, be with us this morning as we encounter Joseph and hear of the unexpected news that he received. Remind us that like Joseph, each one of us is called to trust in your good news. Open our hearts and our spirits today to receive with great joy the love that you have for us. For we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. This time I'd like to invite children and those young at heart to come forward for our children's moment as we all sing This Is Where Children Belong. Good morning. Thank you for coming up here and hanging out with me for a minute. I really appreciate it. You know, one of the best parts about this time of year is a lot of the songs that we sing in church, these Christmas hymns, they're really, really familiar to us, right? Like we we know most of these words. We've heard them not only in church, but this time of year, even a lot of stations on the radio are playing them, and they're just really wonderful, familiar Christmas songs. Well, I have this book here, and this book tells me about the history of most of the hymns we sing in church, including the hymns that we're singing today, the Christmas hymns, some of the Christmas hymns. And the one that we're going to be singing as you head out to Sunday school or head back to sit with your families is one I want to tell you about today. It's called O Little Town of Bethlehem. And I want to give you just a little quick, brief history about when this hymn was written, why it was written, and who were the first people to sing it. This hymn was written by a pastor named Philip Brooks. And while he was serving a church in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, he had the opportunity during Christmas time to go and visit the Holy Land. And on December 24th, so Christmas Eve, 1865, while he was traveling by horseback from Jerusalem, he attended a five-hour, let me say that again, a five-hour Christmas Eve service at the Church of the Nativity in Bethlehem. Can you imagine being in a five-hour church service? Would that be exciting? Well, for him it was exciting, believe it or not. And later, he said that where he was, he was so close to that spot where Jesus was born, and being in that place and hearing those voices as they sang together, it was, it was one of the most special nights of his entire life. Years later, when he was planning for Christmas Eve at his own church, he decided, or he inspired by that time he was in Bethlehem, wrote the song, O Little Town of Bethlehem. But here comes my favorite part of the story. The very first people to ever sing this song, this world-famous song that we are singing in church in a minute, that churches all over the world are singing, that's on the radio, that's on TV, O Little Town of Bethlehem, this famous Christmas song, the first people to sing it were young people like you. A children's choir of 30 kids were the first ones to introduce this famous hymn to the world. And do you know what that reminds me of? It reminds me that each one of you, even if you're a little younger than the adults here, many times you might be the ones to share something new with us, something we never thought about before, something we've never experienced before, something that might even change the world, change how we celebrate Christmas or something else. But in order to do that, I want to remind you that you can always 
always share your opinion, always share your voice, always share your ideas, always share your questions with us here at church. Because we at Mount Tam Church know you can teach the adults just as much, if not more, than the adults can teach you. Will you pray with me? And and I'm going to say a few words, and if you feel comfortable, you can repeat after me during the prayer. Dear God, thank you for all the voices in our church. Help us to remember that we can all learn from each other. Amen. And now as you head out, the rest of us will sing, and you are invited to sing as well, O Little Town of Bethlehem. seated. I think the glasses are up here. I was going to, I was going to get those. I didn't step on them. (laughs) Good morning, Mount Tam. Would you join me in the prayer before reading? Gracious God, open our hearts and minds by the power of your Holy Spirit, that as the scriptures read and your word proclaimed, we may hear what you say to us today. Amen. I'm reading from Matthew 1, 18 to 25, a familiar story. Now the birth of Jesus the Messiah took place in this way. When his mother Mary had been engaged to Joseph, but before they lived together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. Her husband Joseph, being a righteous man and unwilling to expose her to public disgrace, 
planned to dismiss her quietly. But just when he had resolved to do this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for the child conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you are to name him Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what had been spoken by the Lord through the prophet. Look, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall name him Emmanuel, which means God is with us. When Joseph awoke from sleep, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. He took her as his wife, but had no marital relations with her until she had born a son, and he named him Jesus. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. Amen. Amen. Will you once again join me in prayer? God, as we encounter once again this familiar story and the familiar character of Joseph, may your spirit be at work in our minds and in our hearts as we strive to experience this story in a fresh way with renewed meaning for our lives this Christmas. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be holy, acceptable, and pleasing in your sight. Amen. This morning we are continuing our sermon series entitled The Characters of Christmas. During the last few weeks, we've been looking at the announcement of Jesus' birth through the eyes of various people who were confronted with this life-changing and world-changing news. Our first week, we took a closer look at the shepherds and learned about how they were viewed in their culture 2,000 years ago. And we talked about the faith and courage and boldness they must have had in order to be willing to leave their flocks and go out and seek the Christ child that had been announced to them. Then we looked at the villain of the Christmas story, King Herod, and reflected on how God's good news for the world is only good news if we want what God wants. And we talked about how it is so difficult, it can be so difficult to let go of the kingdoms we have built up in order to make way for God's kingdom on earth. Last week, we looked at Mary's story and talked about how God often chooses the most unlikely of characters to carry out some of the most important work here on earth on behalf of God, and that those unlikely characters can include us as well. And this morning, as you are well aware of by this point, we are taking a closer look at the life of Joseph. For me, one of, the, one of the best parts of the holiday season is family traditions. And most of the Thanksgivings in my life were spent at my grandparents' home in Michigan. It's, it's exactly what one might imagine when closing their eyes and thinking of uh, their grandparents' home. It's out in the woods. There was always snow on the trees. It was on uh, many acres, just a beautiful almost cabin-style house out in the woods. And besides of the, the tradition of just being there with all the holiday cooking and, and smells in the air and jumping into leaf piles around the property and baking gingerbread houses, there was another tradition that I always looked forward to. It would be the day after Thanksgiving. We would always go out and, or stay in actually, and break out a cardboard box containing my grandmother's nativity scene. And one by one, we would draw pieces from the nativity set, which was handmade by my great-grandmother many years ago. And each one of us would always have a particular character or animal that we would hope to, to get, because we were just kind of blind 
grabbing it. We never knew what we would get, but we always had what we were hoping for, and of course, the prize was baby Jesus, right? Everybody always wanted baby Jesus. My, but then there was my cousin Corey, for, um, for some reason, he always wanted a camel. He always wanted to find that camel, but we all had the things we were looking forward to. But I don't think any of us, for some reason, ever put Joseph as one of those characters we hoped to draw first. Which is kind of strange since he's one of the three pieces usually at the center of the nativity scene. And it reminds me that beyond just my family, sometimes Joseph is one of those characters that can be overshadowed in the Christmas story. But this morning, I want to remind us that the example he sets for us is probably one of the most important stories of trust and faith in all of our scripture. When I think about Joseph in the days leading up to Mary's pregnancy, I I picture a guy who had finally found the courage and the ability to ask for Mary's hand in marriage. Of course, we don't know what that proposal looked like. We don't know exactly the discussion that he had with Mary's family or Mary herself. We don't have this information in our text. We don't know if he was a smooth and confident talker or if he stuttered his way through the proposal. But what we do know is that there had to be a lot of joy and optimism from Joseph's perspective. He, he had found the woman that he wanted to be his wife. He was probably getting established in his carpentry trade, and he was ready to take on the responsibility of being a dedicated provider and starting a family of his own. But then he finds out that his bride-to-be is carrying a child. Being a good Jewish man and following the rule of the day, he knew that this child could not be his, and we can only imagine that his joy must have turned into deep sadness, perhaps anger. In a blink of an eye, the entire plan for his life was going to change. In June of 2016, I was serving on the pastoral staff at San Ramon Valley United Methodist Church over in the East Bay Area. And on the very last day of school that year, I remember sitting in my office, and all of a sudden, my phone started going wild with text messages and emails and social media updates. You see, on that day... After their last class of their high school career lit out, many of the senior class went and gathered for a pool party. One of the students at this party was named Jake. Jake, who was a football star at San Ramon Valley High School, was looking forward to a summer of fun before heading off to San Luis Obispo to play collegiate football at Cal Poly. With an amazing future to look forward to, the six foot three, 260 pound, all muscle athlete, he dove headfirst into the warm blue water as he had done many times before. But this time, Jake's head hit the bottom of the pool, causing massive trauma at the C5 and C6 vertebrae. Unable to move, he sank to the bottom. And in the moments before anyone realized what had happened, Jake looked up from the bottom of the pool, seeing his classmates swimming and splashing, and he realized that his life had been changed forever. And then in the next moment, he worried that his life may even be coming to an end. Jake says he remembers that he tried to swim up, but he couldn't move. And he remembers thinking, does anyone even know I'm down here? After a few moments, Jake's friends did realize that there was a problem and dove in and helped him to the side of the pool. Jake's memory of the dive in those first few moments after the accident is actually clear. But everything following getting out of the pool and for the following week 
including being airlifted by helicopter to John Muir Medical Center in Walnut Creek and having emergency surgery to stabilize his neck, to fighting to breathe with a collapsed lung, all of that is a blur. Jake's mother, Isabel, and father, Jim, got phone calls that every parent fears. Jim was working at a training session for the Hayward Police Department. He was a 20-year veteran of that police department, and he knew what it meant if a patient was taken to the hospital by helicopter. He knew how serious that situation must have been. So he jumped into a police car with one of his fellow officers, and it was right in the middle of rush hour. So even with the sirens, the lights, it still took him about 45 minutes to get to the hospital, what I imagine was the longest 45 minutes of his life. When his parents arrived, they recalled Jake's first words to them being, I messed up. And what do you mean you messed up is what Isabel responded to Jake. He said, I promised you I would never make you cry. And you're crying. And then right before he was led into surgery, Jake said to his parents, he said, if it's God's plan that I'm not going to walk again, I'm okay with that. Because I know God still has a plan for me. Jake came away from that surgery alive, but still mostly paralyzed from the neck down. Jake's story and courage, of course, touched the hearts of our community. Much like Mill Valley, Danville is a tight-knit town, and soon hundreds of thousands of dollars were raised so that Jake could receive the best medical care possible. And because of that tremendous support, Jake made medical history as the fifth person to ever receive an injection of 10 million stem cells. Jake appreciated the importance of being one of the test cases for treatment that the doctors and scientists hope will not only continue to help him, but continue to be a game changer for future patients. But even with all the latest technology, both that and electrical stimulation that I've read about and still don't fully comprehend, but all of those, Jake still uses a wheelchair to this day. Yet, despite all of that life-changing events and a blink of an eye, Jake decided to commit his life to being an advocate for people with wheelchair disabilities and for stem cell research. And last spring, he graduated from Cal Poly with a degree in biomedical engineering. Now, I want to be really clear here. I do not believe God caused or orchestrated Jake to dive into that pool and become paralyzed. But I do believe that because Jake is open to it, God has used that unexpected difficulty to allow his story of hope and his newfound passion to advocate for others to change the world for the better. Like Jake and his family, in the wake of an unexpected, life-altering change of plans, Joseph had a decision to make. He could let this situation defeat him, he could quietly dismiss Mary, or he could hold a grudge against her, he could hold a grudge against God. But instead, as the gospel writer Matthew tells us, Joseph chose to be open to the guidance he was given by God through a dream. He chose to trust. He chose to have faith. He chose to believe. That openness to God is a powerful example worth following. 
Joseph is open to doing what the heavenly vision suggests, even though it may cost him his reputation as a righteous man, even though there might be whispers of gossip following him and Mary as they walk down the street. He is open, even though there was no what to expect when expecting a Messiah book to read in preparation for that child's arrival. What courage and faith he must have had. Joseph's attention to his dreams continues to save Jesus' life. As we saw when we looked at Herod a couple of weeks ago in Matthew 2.13, he follows a dream's warning to flee with his family to Egypt to escape the murderous king. And when Herod dies, Joseph receives a dream to return. Over and over again, we see that Joseph is open and receptive to the messages and the direction that God has for his life. I want us to make sure and not fall into the trap that thinking that Joseph was merely Christianity's first official stepdad. By taking Mary as his wife and naming the child, Jesus. Joseph was claiming the divinely born child as his own. As both both adopted children and adopting parents in our congregation can attest to, this is the real thing. An adopted child is just as much of a son or daughter as a biological one. And God picked Joseph along with Mary for the solemn responsibility in parenting Jesus. And they both said yes. They both accepted the challenge. K.K. Yao, a New Testament professor at Garrett Theological Seminary near Chicago, puts it this way. For some, faith is honoring people. For others, faith is integrity and responsibility But for Joseph, faith is fully trusting in God's way. As each person in this sanctuary knows, life at some point or another throws us all a wild card, an unexpected reality. Sometimes, like the birth of Jesus, these wild cards are divine in nature. Sometimes, like in the case of Jake, the wild card comes from a unexpected accident. Many times wild cards come from unpredictable, the unpredictable chaos of the universe. But whenever a wild card is thrown our way, it is my hope that we can take the time to listen to how God wants us to play it. Yes, Joseph is often overshadowed by the other characters in this story of Jesus' birth, but may we on this fourth Sunday of Advent take the opportunity to remember his vital role in God's gift to the entire world, his willingness to play the wild card he was dealt. May we not take lightly the faith that Joseph had to have had to be attentive to God working in the world. To wrap things up this morning, I would like to share a poem with you by Anne Weems. This comes from her book, Kneeling at Bethlehem. Then the poem is entitled, Getting to the Front of the Stable. Who put Joseph in the back of the stable? Who dressed him in brown, put a staff in his hand, and told him to stand in the back of the creche, background for the magnificent light of the Madonna? God chosen, this man was faithful in spite of the gossip in Nazareth, in spite of the danger from Herod. This man, Joseph, he listened to the angels, and it was he who named the child. Is this a man to be stuck for centuries in the back of the stable? Actually, Joseph probably stood in the doorway, guarding the mother and the child and greeting shepherds and kings. 
When he wasn't in the doorway, he was probably urging Mary to get some rest, gently covering her with his cloak, assuring her that he would watch the child. Actually, he probably picked the child up in his arms and walked him in the night, patting him lovingly until his eyes were closed. The poem concludes, This Christmas, let us give thanks to God for this man of incredible faith into whose care God placed Christ, the Christ child. As a gesture of gratitude, let's put Joseph in the front of the stable where he can guard and greet and cast an occasional glance at this child who brought us life. May it be so. Amen. In response to the gift of the Christ child, and indeed in response to all of the gifts we have in our life, we are invited to offer a gift back. We are not passing the offering plates during this service, but you are invited to leave a gift, if you would like, in the offering plates at the back of the sanctuary as you depart. If you are worshiping with us online, you can give through our website, but since we're not passing plates right now, it gives us the opportunity to give our full attention to the beautiful offertory music we will experience and to think about those things we are especially grateful for over the last week. Hark how the bells, sweet silver bells, all seem to say, throw cares away. Christmas is here, bring good cheer to young and old. We gather both, ding dong, ding dong, God is our song. We joyful ring, dog carol. One seems to hear words of good cheer from everywhere, filling the air. Oh, how they pound, raising the sun. Do you know?
join me once again in prayer. Holy God, we give thanks for all the gifts in our life. And so we offer back this portion to the work of your church. We pray that these gifts that we share might be used according to your holy and perfect will as we strive to be a church that follows in the way of Joseph, that is open to the new ways you are working in the world. Amen. You may be seated. One of the ancient practices of the Christian church when we gather together for worship is to lift up our joys and concerns. Not only lift them up to God, but lift them up to one another, recognizing that when one of us is celebrating, we all find joy in that. And when one of us is carrying a heavy burden, we're all called to rally around that person. I want to kick things off with a joy. Of course, we have the joy of the the Barr family uh, providing our music today, Uh, but I want to call special attention to Lockwood, who is here with us from Nashville, where she uh, has now, my understanding is on CMT Music, has one of the number one Christmas songs uh, on there. So if any of us, yes. So after worship, uh, Google Lockwood Bar CMT, and I'm sure that video will come up and we can all add to the views and keep you in first place. That's good. Shifting gears, we also think about this time of year being very difficult for folks who uh, do not have loved ones nearby or who, uh, due to 
lots of things happening in our world aren't able to return home for the holidays, and we lift them up in prayer. And so for both the joy of having a family back as well as the sorrow of some families not being able to be together in person, we lift those prayers to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayers. What prayers do you bring with you here today? What prayers would you like to lift up? Yes, Barbara. Of course. The joy of Hung Jung as well and all the beautiful music she provides us all year round. We give thanks for her and lift that prayer of thanks to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayers. Yes, Lisa. We lift up prayers for Victor, who in the midst of being joyful of graduating with his graduate degree and accepting a new job, then lost his wife. And that stark change in, in reality, we pray for him during this time when our words on encountering something like that fall short. And then we also pray for those in Kentucky and that region of the country that have been devastated by the tornadoes that have come through there recently. We lift these prayers to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayers. Yes, Sue. Uh, Yes. Yes, we lift up prayers for Willie as he prepares for some tests in the upcoming weeks and prepares to receive those test results as well. We lift this prayer to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayers. Any others? Yes, Leslie. Prayers for Steve, who is fighting stage four lung cancer. We pray that God's healing spirit might be at work, and we pray for his medical team who is working with him. We lift these prayers to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayers. Others. Oh, Gail. For Gail Griffin and her family, and thank you for the life she had born, an old friend who passed this week and was ready to go at 92. We lift up prayers for Gail Grissom and her family. We, many of us know that Gail has been in a lot of pain lately, and so we pray for God's comforting spirit surrounding her during this time. And then the second person you mentioned, their name? Pierre. Pierre. And, and he passed away at age 92. And so we pray for his family and friends that are mourning his loss. We lift these prayers to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayers. Any others? Yes, Emily. Yes, during this time of year, we remember that it is especially tough for all those who are mourning the loss of a family member. And we also lift up prayers that we might just encourage ourselves and encourage one another to continue following safe health uh, protocols and guidelines, even though it has been so long and such, such a difficult journey, but that we can just stay motivated to keep one another safe. We lift these prayers to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayers. Any others? Ah, yes, David. Oh, thank you. Prayers for racial justice and prayers for our country during this time of such dissent and so many worries. And I appreciate you uh, lifting up a prayer of thanks for me. And I'll reciprocate by lifting up a prayer of thanks for all of you. We lift these prayers to the Lord. 
Lord, hear our prayers. Yes, Winnie. prayers for the, did you say the shelter challenge? And then for refugees where? For the refugees who are just suffering. Yes, just for refugees throughout our world who are displaced and suffering during this time. And we pray that those in their midst might have open hearts to welcoming and supporting them. We lift this prayer to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayers. Any others? So, oh, Yes. Yes, Elaine. May people have their eyes open to the joy and the meaning of this feast. Yes, prayers for our live drive through nativity, prayers of thanks for all who are participating and making this happen. And we pray for each person who drives through that they might remember and cherish the reason for Christmas. We lift these prayers to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayers. Seeing no others, I invite us to take a moment in silent prayer as we lift up anything else that we hold close to our heart. Holy God, as we have heard in the prayers lifted up this morning, we arrive in this place from many different directions. Some are here after joyous things, milestones reached, and others arrive here with worry or burdens or the knowledge of deep sadness in our community or in their lives. We come before you with health concerns. We lift up testing and test results. We come before you thinking about those families and communities that have lost loved ones. God, we lift up prayers about racial justice and about being, being a loving community in the ways not only that we treat one another based on our race, but also how we treat one another with health concerns and how we treat one another and, and allow ourselves to provide safety, health safety, during this time where there are so many renewed health concerns. God, for any of the prayers that have gone unmentioned, for any of the prayers which go beyond the words that we have in this moment, we turn those over to you as well, with the knowledge and the faith that you know our hearts, you know our minds, you know what we are dealing with, you know what we are seeing in the world, for that is truly what Christmas is about. It's about you breaking into this world to be with us, to be among us, to walk among us, to experience the joys we experience, the pains we experience, the sorrow we experience. You, through Jesus, have experienced all of that and so much more. And you love us through it all. Your spirit stays present with us through it all. May we be bold enough to continue to love one another, care for one another, forgive one another through it all as well. As we with one voice share the prayer your son taught us, our creator who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. And recognizing that each one of us is a reflection of our Creator, we now have a, a moment in our service where I invite you to stand as you are able and greet one another in peace.
To conclude worship today, we're going to step into a small wild card moment during our prayer time. Lockwood felt uh, inspired to share a poem that she came across with us, and I'm going to invite her to read that for us as our benediction. From, uh, from my pastor Clay in Nashville, um, and it is for losing loved ones specifically around the Christmas holidays. I see the countless Christmas trees around the world below with tiny lights like heaven stars reflecting on the snow. The sight is so spectacular, please wipe away that tear, for I'm spending Christmas with Jesus Christ this year. I hear the many Christmas songs that people hold so dear, but the sounds of music can't compare with the Christmas choir up here. For I have no words to tell you the joy their voices bring, for it is beyond description to hear an angel sing. I can't tell you of the splendor or the peace here in this place. Can you just imagine Christmas with our Savior face to face? I ask him to light your spirit as I tell him of your love, so then pray for one another as you lift your eyes above. Please let your heart be joyful and let your spirit sing. For I'm spending Christmas in heaven and I'm walking with the king. I know how much you miss me. I see the pain inside your heart. But I'm not so far away. We really aren't apart. So be happy for me, dear ones. You know I hold you dear. And be glad I'm spending Christmas with Jesus Christ this year. I send you each a special gift from my heavenly home above. I send you each a memory of my undying love. After all, love is the gift more precious than pure gold. It was always most important in the stories Jesus told. Please love and keep each other as my father said to do, for I can't count the blessings or the love he has for you. So Merry Christmas and wipe away that tear. Remember, I'm spending Christmas with Jesus Christ this year. And faith, hope, joy, and love. May we go into the world. Amen.